How many of you have your Bibles? Uh, I want you to open up to Proverbs chapter 3, uh, verses 5 through 10. And I am so grateful for Pastor Steve. He has written this series, and it's In God We Trust. And today we're going to begin to talk about trust God's priority for money. Uh, Steve, last week taught on God's perspective. Today, we're going to begin to speak on God's priority. I want you to think of two words. I want you to write this down, and it's called first fruits, first fruits. And again, I want you to know in this series, it's trusting God, first of all, with our minds, then we trust God with our money. I want to speak this. We will never trust God with our money if we do not trust God with our minds. Trust Trusting God begins in the mind and its expression is on how we handle our money and actually trust God with our money. And you must know this, giving God first fruits, say that with me, first fruits, if you're Spanish, primero. Hey, you like that R? Come on, that's a good one. So first fruits, I don't, how do you, como se dice fruit in Espanol? Fruit, okay. Um, <laughs> Primero fruit, you know what I'm talking about. And so first fruits, and you must know this, requires faith. Uh, leftovers requires no faith. And a first fruit offering opens us up to God's work in our lives. And this power of generosity cannot be underestimated. Now, today, I want to dedicate this. I normally don't do it, but I want to do it. And I would say the person that I have met in 38 years, a few days from now, it would be 38 full-time years I've been in ministry. Yeah, I'm that old. And this person is the number one person that's lived this scriptural principle out, first fruits. And today is her birthday, and she enters a new decade. And you know what she's doing? She went down to Mexico where she's going to train and cut hair. She's been in the beauty cosmetology industry for years. And Janet Rovner has lived this principle more than anyone I've ever met. She was a type of woman believer. I want to say it this way. She started as a shampoo girl. And if she would get a new client, whatever she made, if it was the first time, she would bring that to the Lord. Can I say? leftovers take no uh, faith first fruit takes faith Janet is a woman of faith and our world needs faith not doubt can you say amen and and I love what Steve said last week I'm going to say it then you're going to repeat it after me he said God wants something for us not from us that he can go through us I want you to say this say God wants something for us not from us don't think when you come to church and someone mentions tithing or first fruits or giving that we're trying to get something from you. God does not need anything from us. If God is in need, then he's not God. You can't take away from God. You can't add to God. He's God all by himself. And by the way, he's not El Chipo. He's El Shaddai. He's not broke. And he owns 10,000 Cadillacs and 1,000 Oaks. And he has has no need of your currency he has his own we need to begin to know why he says honor him with first fruits can you say amen and say this with me say God wants something through me no 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 I messed it up Steve wrote it my goodness how many of you ever mess it up how many of you ever I can't be a worship leader I want to be a worship leader but I mess up the songs. I make up my own words. Thank you, Becky, for that. Wrap me out, okay, before God and the people. Here we go. Say, God wants something for us, not from us. Please know that God wants something for you, not from you. But when you participate in this thing called tithing and first fruits, then something can flow through you. Let's do this. When we, put trust, when we put our trust in God, he will pave the way for us. Say that with me. When we put our, he will pave the way for us. And Pastor Steve quoted that from the Amplified means he'll take obstacles out of the way. He will pave the way. Now, this is what I want to do. Normally, 
I bring up a traditional Bible because we are believers. And when you come to church, whether you're kind of believing or you're just beginning believing, um, we can't fake it. We can't hide it. Uh, we are those people who believe in the Bible. Okay, we really do. We just soon come out with it. And but a lot of people do not bring traditional Bibles to church. How many of you have just a regular traditional Bible? Wave it. Come on. Wave your Bibles in the air because you do care. Okay, all three of you. All right. You could tell the old school Christians from the 90s. They have those big, it's the size of a refrigerator Bible with a Bible cover. And it takes two hands to do that, you know. But this is what I want you to start doing. Get your iPhone or your Google phone or your smartphone right now. And in mine, it's you version. It's complimentary. And I want to begin to train you. I'm not only a communicator, I'm a pastor. And if I'm to accurately in pastor you or shepherd you well, I have to also instruct you that when we come to church, we are not spectators at a sporting event, but we are participators, living stones in the very body of Christ, and we participate with the word of God. So they're going to put the verse on the screen, and it's going to be in different colors, because I want to read these verses, 5 to 10, but I'm want to train you on how to read your Bible. Jesus asked an attorney in the New Testament, how do you read? Oftentimes people never have the word of God generate a belief in them because of the way they read. And do not depend on the screen for your reading. Depend on your own eyes, your own you version, your own Bible on your smartphone that the word of God, can I say it's not just me reading the Bible. I want the Bible to read me. Amen. And so we're going to look at this. We're going to read. And if you'll see on this, do you see some of the words are in black and some are in yellow? I am going to slightly turn. I could quote this without even looking at it, but I want to show you a correlation that when you read specifically in Proverbs, it's usually a statement that is positive than one that's negative. In other cases, he says it one way than another way. How many of your wife, she knows how to communicate that way, one way, then another way, you know, give me the remote or you will sleep downstairs. Are you with me? One way, then another way. Her words are like a double-edged sword dividing between my soul and spirit. Here we go. All right. Everyone say trust. And then I want you say lean not. Say it again. Say trust. Lean not. So you must know that trust in the Hebrew has a picture of leaning. One of the reasons people never have a breakthrough in their life or their finances because they partially lean into God. They feel guilty. They may have done something that is addictive and it keeps coming up and it destroys their life. And they kind of put a little bit of trust in God. But when you trust in the Lord with all, look at it, it's on the screen right there. You see that trust in the Lord with one. What? With what? In Louisiana, they go all. You think they're saying O-I-L, all, but it's all, A-L-L. -L. Trust in the Lord with what? All. What? All. Ladies said? All. Men said? All. all your heart. Then get this, lean not to your own understanding. So it shows you two different ways. King Solomon showing the way you trust God with all your heart, you can't lean into your own understanding. Look, and then how do we know we're not leaning in our own understanding? Look at the next part. Port. <laughs> I'm having trouble speaking today. In all your ways, acknowledge him. Are you reading it with me? In all and he shall, now when Steve says pave the road in the Amplified, it means he'll take obstacles out of your path. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Shout out wise. wise. Give me one more. Wise. Give me another one. Wise. Okay, do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord, shun evil. We're going to talk about what that evil is. Then it goes, it will be health to your body. Can I say worship brings health in your body and nourishment to your bones? 
Do you hear that? I want to stop right now. And you don't even think about your bones when you're a teenager in your early 20s. You know when you think about your bones when you get to be 50 or 60? You start thinking, oh, my elbow bone is hurting. My knee bone is hurting. My back bone is hurting. Wait a minute. No, I speak to my bones. I worship the Lord. I fear the Lord. It's health to this body and it's nourishment to these bones. Knee, you're going to work on a new standard in Jesus his name. Amen. Okay. 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 Here we go. Say honor the Lord. And look at this. Let's go to that one. Honor the Lord. I'm looking for it. Oh, here it is. Everyone say honor possessions, first fruits filled. Now listen to this. I want to just read this. It says honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first fruits of all your increases. Why? That your barns would be filled with plenty and your vats would brim over with new wine. Everyone say perspective. And I love that. It says, do not lean into your own understanding, your own perspective. In life, there's two types of perspectives. One is from above and one is from beneath. Let's do it another way. James says it this way. One is from heaven and one is from earth. I want you to begin to think as you look at this graphic of this series, In God We Trust, America didn't start off in 1776 with that emblem on our currency. It happened after the Civil War. There was such a division in the nation, uh, the leaders of our nation didn't think America would make it. And they begin to print on the coins of America, not our paper currency, but coins, they would begin to print in God we trust. Then after the Cold War, because the former Soviet Union really was going with the perspective that there isn't a God. Can I say it right now in this election year, I think we need to be, pa I think we need a pause. I think we need to consider heaven's perspective. I don't think really the difference is between conservatives or pro progressives. I think it is between a secular worldview, a godless worldview, and a God worldview worldview. And the Bible says that there are two types of wisdom. And you have to understand when you read scripture and you hear things like trust, lean not, in all your ways acknowledge he is going to pave your path then he goes on and says honor the lord shun evil then it says this do not be wise in your own eyes well when is the first time wisdom mentioned in the bible and your mind should begin to think like that when you read on your smartphone a verse like we just read not just in church but for your everyday living make your mind ask questions meaning when is is this the first time mentioned? Well, in chapter three of Genesis, the snake appeared to a woman, which is really, uh, it, it's interesting because if a snake appears to any woman right now, they're going to scream, you know, uh, but not Eve. And she starts talking to the snake and she get this. She saw that the forbidden fruit was appealing for what? To give her wisdom. And she wanted wisdom apart from God. She wanted a wisdom independent and autonomous of God. And God says that is an evil. You see, it's not knowledge that America needs. We have more knowledge. Come on, AI and everything else that's being produced. The problem isn't knowledge. The problem is wisdom. We do not know how to apply the knowledge we have, and we can't even keep up with it. And now we want to be our own Bible. I don't want to be my own Bible. No, I don't understand everything in the Bible. But there is one thing I'm going to tell you right now. I want the Bible's perspective. I don't want Earth's perspective. Perspective. I want God's perspective. I don't want just my perspective. I want to lean into the wisdom of God that is pure, that's peaceable, that's easy to be entreated. It's not partial and it's without a mask or a hypocrisy. You don't have to be a play actor. I want the wisdom of God. Can you say amen? <laughs> I love the way you clap. You know, that, that's like going to Sea World, amen, when the orca comes down and the porpoise, you know, mm, mm, I love that. Can you say amen? 
Everyone say shun evil. And the evil that we're shunning is to do our money without God or live without God or have a wisdom that is apart from God. Everyone say tithe. Tithe simply means 10%. So if you make $100 in a week, you give $10. If you make $1,000 in a week, you give $100. It simply means 10%. Now, many people say in this scripture, honor the Lord with all your possessions and with the first fruits. Everyone say first fruits. With the first fruits of your income, what many theologians would say, and even today, you could Google it, they'll say, honor the Lord with your first fruits isn't speaking about tithing. That is correct. Tithing is when we bring 10%. I will get to the first fruits in a moment. You say, well, tithing, I don't believe in tithing because tithing isn't a part of grace or the New Testament. Well, let me just tell you, first of all, tithing is mentioned before the law. And Abraham gave the priest and the king of Salem, he was a king of peace, a king of righteousness. He gave him a tenth of all. Then we know tithing is in the law. You could read in the Levitical law that you would bring 10%. Jesus had religious people come to him and they said, Lord, we even tithe on our spices. Can you imagine? Lord, I just got a pound of cilantro. I don't even know what 10% of a pound is, but Becky would figure it out. All right. It's going to make your tacos taste a little bit better. And so they would give uh, a tithe. They said, Lord, we tithe on our spices. Jesus said, you should do that. He never said don't tithe. He said you should tithe on that, but you should not have forgotten the weightier matters of the law, meaning tithing may cause your 90% to be blessed, but if you're not filled with mercy and humility and justice, your money's not going to save you. Come on. In, in, thank you, ma'am, for that overwhelming support. I love that. And then Carter just kicked in. Man, you got to know that was good. Can you say amen? amen. Now, what is uh, an offering? An offering, I like what Pastor Steve said. Tithing is an act of obedience by giving to God what he says is his. Tithing is an act of obedience. Say that with me. Tithing is an act of obedience by giving, by giving, by giving. By giving, by giving. By the way, it says he gives seed to the sower, not to the selfish. All right, we'll move on. By giving God what he says is his. Now, there are two perspectives on money. Write this down. One is what would be called a poverty perspective. Another one is what they would call a prosperity perspective. I was being interviewed by Nathan Finocchio for Theo Hsu. And uh, the name of the podcast was Where's the Faith? Uh, and which I thought was funny. Uh, WTF, Where's the Faith? And he said, Pastor Jude. Thank you, Mike. You're the only one who got that. <laughs> and Carter. And, and so I kid you not. He said, Pastor Jude, what do you think of the prosperity gospel? And he says, well, what is the opposite? The broke gospel? I said, Jesus with the gospel, commands his church to feed the poor, to clothe people, to help people in need. How can the poor help the poor? The last thing I checked, we had a swimming pool growing up. If you're drowning, please do not jump in the pool if you don't know how to swim to save the drowning person because two drowning people will drown each other. The church needs to prosper, to heal, and touch, and reach the world. Can you say amen? Now, let me just tell you some wrong perspectives on giving. And I've heard this, and it really chaps my hide. Worse than salsa made in New York City. I've heard this. Give and you will get. Meaning, like, if you remember in the 70s, how many of you were alive in the 70s? Uh, who was raised in the 80s? Come on, the best music ever. The roof, the roof, the roof is on fire. Okay. This is what they said in the 80s. Give that you will get. Meaning, if you put a dollar, you got a Coca-Cola or a Pepsi. Now it's $5. It's gone up. It says, give 
$5 and you get something out. I think that put a lot of believers in a world of hurt. Give a dollar, you get 10. Give 10, you get 100. Give 100, you get 1,000. Give 1,000, you get 10,000. Give 10,000, you get 100. That is not wise. I think it's wrong to give to get. And I also think it's wrong that, well, I give, but I don't expect anything. Well, even a natural farmer expects. He puts corn in the ground. He's not expecting asparagus to come out. Why? Because it makes your urine smell. That's why. No, come on. I hate it. Every time my wife goes, babe, can we have roasted asparagus for an appetizer? No. No, of course we do because I yield. Amen. And so... I don't believe in give to get or give and don't expect anything. I will tell you the greatest way to look at giving is Hebrews. It says, when we tithe, we witness that he lives. That we give tithes here on earth to mortal men. In an earthly wisdom or perspective, yeah, you go to church and they ask for money. Well, go to Chick-fil-A and they're going to ask for money too. And if you go to Burger King because you're a whopper, they're going to ask for money too. We are not asking for your money because we don't need your money, but we believe that first fruits is an act of faith. And why would God say, honor me with the first fruits? Because it's a principle that is ingrained in the universe. And when we go against this vital principle that is sacred, we get splinters in our soul. We get debt in our finances, and then we begin to blame God. God must be given first. Why? Because God is first. Okay, you don't believe me. He's so first, he says, I'm alpha. You know, by the way, I'm omega. I'm the first, I'm the last. I'm the highest, I'm the greatest. I'm the goodest or the best, I am God. We do not bring to God leftovers, we bring to God our first fruits. Can you say yeah? Now, watch this. They had two brothers, Cain and Abel. And it says, they each brought an offering to the Lord. Now, I love what Pastor Steve wrote last year and this year. An offering is what God says belongs to us, but we give it to him. Charitable giving is what belongs to us, but we give it to others. They had two boys, two men, Cain and Abel. And I like this. I want you to write this down, but I want you to begin to think through the process of time, through the process of time. Each of them, Abel and Cain, brought an offering to the Lord. Abel brought first fruits from the herd. And it says Cain brought an offering. And God accepted the offering of Abel, but rejected the offering of Cain. For a long time, I thought the purpose and the reason God rejected Cain's offering because it wasn't a blood sacrifice. In the Old Testament, commands that sin is forgiven through the shedding of blood. But that is not why, because Cain did not have a herd. He was a farmer. But through the process of time, Cain brought an offering. Then although in Proverbs 3, where it says, honor the Lord with the first fruits, we, it's not speaking of tithing, but it teaches the principle of first. So I want you to write this reference down. Probably one of the greatest references in the greatest sermon ever preached is Matthew chapter 6. It's Matthew 5, 6, and 7 called the Sermon on the Mount. And Jesus says in 633, seek first. I'm going to say it again. Seek, seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added. It speaks of kingdom, mean, kingdom meaning God is Lord. He's number one. He wants to rule our lives. So seek first the kingdom of God. One thing that Becky and I did, and when we were first married and when I became a believer, and I have to say, first of all, I love the Bible. 
Uh, this is my 44th year reading through it. I'm in Second Chronicles. Thank God I've gotten through all the begats. Amen. And I read and prayed the prayer of Jabez, all right? He caused his mom pain. The Lord enlarged the borders of my territory. God heard that prayer, and I prayed it. But let me tell you, these words are living. They're powerful. They're active, and we should consider them. And it says this, seek first the kingdom of God in all his righteousness, and all these things will be added. One thing that Becky and I did as new believers and as Christians, we didn't obey everything. I don't understand everything in the Bible, but the, do, the parts I do understand, I try to obey. And I think that's how you're approaching this. I, I really want to obey God. Now, do I always obey God? No. I won't tell you an area Becky and I always obeyed God. We tithe. And we didn't tithe because we went to a church campaign or some pastor tr manipulated and twisted our arms. I think the reason I tithe for the first reason, it's because of my own father who died when I was 16. My dad was beyond crazy generous. All my mother's brothers and sisters, he helped them with down payments, got into their homes, helped them go to trade school, college, whatever they wanted to pursue, that was my father. And when he died, I had a sense that God was just as generous, if not more, than my dad. And when I heard, I had not really heard of 10%. I just saw a life of generosity modeled before me that when I heard it, I knew that it was right. And I can honestly, I sit before you this morning and say there was not once where we did not tie and where we were really sticklers on this. This is way before like electronic giving or you give on your computer. You actually, the keys are playing. Some of you just freaked out, went like this. Mrs. Taylor, she's a part of the church. She went to the greatest Bible college in the world. She's good, okay? I never gave to impress God. I believed it. And before all this electronic giving, we actually used to write a check. And I would say, Becky, write the tie check first. I want you to write it for, why? because he is first. It took no faith for Cain to just bring an offering. I remember we were making, look, I had a job over $100 million worth of accounts with a Fortune 500 company, Procter & Gamble. And I could tell you, if I stayed and that was my career, I would probably be the president of Procter & Gamble, I kid you not. And money would not be an issue like my father before me. But I was called to youth ministry. And so was my beautiful, intelligent wife, who's a respiratory therapist and could have made four to five times the amount of money. She did, but we were called. And I know what it is to have $1,400 come in and have rent be $833. Our health insurance was three fifty six. dollars I'll never forget, I went to Becky that day. I said, do we still tithe? Do we still give him first? First fruits, is that dependent on my salary? First fruits, is it dependent on inflation or who's in the White House or how high uh, interest rates are? Is that first fruit? Does that decide how we live our lives? Is it because now we struggle paying rent or a mortgage and we got a master card and we thought it's the master and it was the wrong master because now you have thousands of dollars on the card? I've been there. And I'll never forget, I said, Becky, do we tie? She said, babe, we must, because he is first. And so what would we do? 1,400, I even said it, she wrote it out. I lifted the check before we came to church. I said, Lord, here it is. My whole stinking life is a tithe. But we're doing this, kind of like Janet Rovner. I think why I vibe with her is because I think that's how we all should be. I think we come to the money part of being a Christian and we start to become analytical. And probably the number one area we totally lean into our own understanding is with money. But if we get a deadly diagnosis and it's outside our realm of comprehension and above our pay uh, raise or pay scale, oh, then we start trying to trust the Lord. 
And you need to trust God when you get a scary diagnosis. But you know what you can do every day and I can do every day? I can trust the Lord with all my heart. I don't have to lean into that perspective. But in all my ways, I can acknowledge him. And I can honor him with first fruits. Why? Because it takes faith to give first. Sue Jewett, we did it. We'd write the tie check to City Church, $140. Then it went the mortgage, the rent payment, then the health insurance. And if you believe in the poverty gospel and you're a man, son, never get married. Women are expensive. And the vow of poverty for a Catholic priest is for a celibate man, not a married man. So if you want the vow of poverty, you can't get married. Because you have to provide. But what do you do when you have the tension of providing, i.e., put your kid in a Christian school, and paying bills in this thing called tithing? The temptation was too great for Jude and Becky. We wrote it first. And you be in the buckets going, you're going, wait, wait, give it back. I need that. How many of you ever had an ouch offering? You hadn't given enough. You put the check and you go, ouch. It goes to the next row. Excuse me, excuse me. No, I, I need to get this back. I don't know if I trust you. I mean, if you, am I the only one I trust? Then I don't trust. I mean, okay, yeah, I mean, have you ever been to a Pentecostal church where they go to the altar? Altar time. Shoot, I put so many things on the altar only to run down and take it right back off. Are you with me? Now, listen to this. God, so much in the first, he said, if you had a donkey, you had to redeem the donkey with a clean animal or you had to break its neck. You know what a donkey represents? Come on, Shrek. It represents an idolatrous, stubborn will. You know, Missouri's called the show me state because of the stubborn mule. Can I say the greatest thing that will break the neck of idolatrous independence, America, is maybe we need to start tithing again. Why are we letting markets determine our financial success and not what the word of God says? Why are we constantly dogging other people? I want to obey God. Can you say amen? Stand up with me. Stand up. Stand up. I want to read these scriptures. Everyone say priority. Say this after me. Say the way I give. This is really important. I wrote it. Say, the way I give is the way I live. If you give by giving leftovers, that's what God will be to you. A tip for a server at a restaurant and go clock in and clock out for a little bit at church. And I'm just saying that that's not why I give. I started giving in a crazy way. Someone asked me the last service. Do you and Pastor Becky only give 10% truthfully? We moved on from 10% probably over 25 years ago with kids in Christian school living on the West Coast. Yeah, anybody and their mother can move to Texas. It takes faith to live here. <laughs> and for the record, I hate the Cowboys. I want you to know God even does this. Think of Abraham. He had one son, Isaac. He put him on an altar. And God said, because you did not withhold your first, now you will be blessed and so will the world. How about God himself? You think God needs to obey this? God is this. God had one only begotten son. And he gave him first. Remember Mary? Man, that girl was broke. He had seven demons. She went. She thought he was the gardener. Where have you laid my Lord? Mary, Rabboni, meaning rabbi, teacher. She went, come on, hugs, not drugs, she's saying. 
goes, no, 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 girl, back up. I need to go to the Father because this body is first fruit. I look back and our lives are truly <laughs> indescribable. We have three kids and really no major sicknesses with them. I have two sons in the ministry. I was in Vacaville last week. I'm in a workshop with hundreds of youth pastors and leaders. My Jude is on my right and my Jake is in the middle. No, Jake's on my right, Jude's on the other right and I'm at the end. And they're asking this question. And if you think this is just about money, you're wrong. Keep your money, we don't want it. I'm smiling, but this is the number one way God will know if you trust him. But you will never understand the ramifications of this. Because as I sat and I heard my son speak, then I thought, there's something greater to life than money itself. But it's ignorant foolish not to consider money scriptures say money makes the whole world go around and some people say money's evil no money's not evil the love of money is evil you say lord help me not love it well if you think you love it give all you have away and it will cure that money is amoral but when i give god my first 10 percent The 90% is made holy. It it, it begins to have within it an eternal value where your money goes beyond you and it can outlive you and it can shape all that you love. If you are a thug and you get the Powerball, you're going to be more than a thug. If you are generous and you win the Powerball, you're going to be generous. Oh, Powerball got up to a billion. You know I went and got me a couple Powerball. You know I did. Don't look at me like you're... Well, if I won, you get nothing. You know when I told the Lord, Lord, I get this one? Got it from Happy Donuts. Then I went to my Crack Alley Vons. I said, give me one of those winning tickets. I even use the name of the Lord. In the name of Jesus, this is a winner. (laughs) Kid you not, after that billion-dollar ticket, I said, Lord, you get 50% of this. He said, why don't you start giving me 50% of your regular income, then I'll believe you. I won, by the way. It said winner. Oh, God, my heart went. Oh, God, somebody call Becky. Kind of like Fred Sammon. Lamar, I'm coming. You know, I won five bucks. You know what I did with that five bucks? It wasn't first fruits. I gave it away. Here. Okay, Lord. You know, everyone say tithe and first fruit. And why? Because God gave Jesus. Why? That you could become a child of God. Amen. I want you to do this. I want to pray for you. Number one, I believe first fruits begins with prayer. I mean this. Janet Rovner is a person who prays. She gets $1,000 that she'll say, God, is this mine? Maybe she was going to buy a sofa or a couch, and she gives it to a missionary. I think another one, I think we need to begin to prepare. We need to prepare to live our lives as tithing people. I think we also need to prioritize that we prioritize God. And the number one to do, the way to do that is your money, your time, your energy, and your gifts. And the last one, we give. God so loved the world, he didn't take, he gave. Let's begin to pray. Father, we come and, Lord, our hands are out. And I don't want to give you leftovers. That takes no faith. And really, that is the greatest evil, to obtain wisdom, grace, vision, anything apart and independently of you. And God, I say, forgive me. Forgive me when I've trusted you 
but my trust led to a mistrust and I began to lean into my own perspective. God, I pray we all want wisdom. And you said in James, if we lack it, you'll give it to us without finding fault. Grant us a heavenly biblical wisdom on how to offer to you first fruits, the holy tithe in the day we live in. God, where discretionary spending is absolutely evaporated, rent is going sky high, gasoline prices, food prices, God, none of that determines you being first. You are first, and we honor you with first fruits. And we pray that. You know, in a moment, I'm going to count to three, and you probably believe in God. I believe most of us here and online believe in God. But I want to ask you, are you ready to trust God with all of you? Are you ready to stop leaning into the way you think? Would you be open that God is more intelligent than you are? Would you trust that God is for you and not against you? Will you honor God by making him first, not giving him your leftovers? I'm going to count to three. And if you need to say, I am making God first, I'm going to acknowledge him in every part of my life. On three, you're going to raise your hand. And something sovereign is going to happen to you. Your life isn't just going to be a believing life. Your life is going to be a transformed life. God is not calling you just to believe. The devil believes. God is calling you to be a part of his family. And when you become a child of God, my friend, you have all of God behind you and for you. So today you're saying, I'm trusting in you. You're going to raise your hand on three. One, you're saying, I am making you the Lord of every part of my life. Two, and on three, when you raise your hand, you're saying, God, I'm honoring you with every part of me. Three, right now, raise your hand. I see your hand in the back. See your hand in the back. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Come on, stomp, shout, cheer. Let's say this. Everyone say, Lord Jesus, I trust you. With all my heart, I lean not to my own understanding. In all my ways, I acknowledge you. Pave the way for me. I will fear you, worship you. I will shun evil. I will not be wise in my own opinion. But I am going to trust you. And I'm going to honor you with first fruits. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.